Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. This is the show where we bring you the musician's story, and I am super psyched today. Rock drummer extraordinaire and uh, educator and author, drummer for Styx and so many other great artists. Todd Zuckerman is on the show with us today. Welcome, Todd. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. A pleasure to, to connect with you and, and meet with you and have you here. Um, you know, we're, we're broadcasting live from the Motor Studios in Portland, Maine. Let us know where you're watching from, whether you're live or in the replay. Where are you today, Todd? I'm uh, I'm definitely live. Um, hopefully. Yes. Uh, okay. And I'm, uh, I'm, in the, I'm in the office. I'm at home in uh, Austin, Texas, right now. Oh, fantastic! Beautiful place. Beautiful a little place. Break, a little break before I, I take off for a 23 day run. So. Yeah. So let's. Can we start with sticks? Sure. Man. Uh, yeah. You're you're on tour with sticks. You're on a little bit of a break. What is it like playing with this uh, iconic classic rock band? You know, I've seen videos of you walking out on stage to 20, 30,000 people. What is that like? Uh, you, well, you know, it's always amazing, and I never take it for granted. Um, you know, it, it's it's been my job for a long time now. So I, I never, you know, people ask me, do I, you know, do I get nervous? I, no, I never get nervous. It's more of a, an excitement of let me at them. This is why we're here and this is a fun job to have so you know to be able to play in a band that sings as well plays as well and cares as much as these guys do um that's that's really the thing that's amazing because that that level of um that level of of of, of care comes from the top down and whether we're playing in a field in nebraska and it's 102 degrees or we're in the air conditioning in new york city everybody gets the same show those guys are 20 years my senior and they they never phone it in they leave it on the stage every night and that that is a thrilling uh and a challenging uh situation to have on a nightly basis yeah it's unbelievable talk a little bit about how you got the gig in the first place please you know i'm asked this a lot and people always assume that there was some sort of audition or i knew somebody's cousin or something, something like that. Like that. Uh, uh, the, the reality, reality is, 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 is the fact that, that I said yes, said yes to every, every gig, gig for years and years and years and years. And years played every dive bar, played every grimy, gross thing, you know, involved in different band projects. And that led me to the point where I was doing a lot of recording sessions in Chicago. And at that time, Chicago is like the mecca for, for jingles, you know, music for radio and, and TV commercials. So that was sort of the, uh, the super high-end work, uh, if you could get it. And in time, I started working with some musicians that were in that scene, and that pulled me into that scene. Uh, and it was because that was really my job before the band. I was doing 20 to 30 sessions a month wow. in those days, and I had drum kits flying around the city. And the guy who was taking care of my gear was a guy named Keith Marks. He'd worked with the band in the past. He'd worked with the guys on their solo records. And uh, when they were going to get together to record um, Lady, uh, a new version of that for the greatest hits record that was to come. Uh, John Panazzo, the original drummer, was in ill health and was unable to physically play. So they called, oops, I think I lost you. I lost your, uh... oh, oh, there I'm you go, you're back. I'm still here, yep. You're back, you're back. Um, <laughs> anyway, they, they, they called Keith and they said, who should we get? And he said, oh, we should call Todd Zuckerman. So that was really the genesis of, uh, of meeting those guys was getting called into ghost drum on a recording session. And then they called me back the following year um, to uh, record a new piece of music and I could tell something was brewing and um, the next day they asked me what was I doing that summer? And that's that's how it all came about. It's amazing and, and obviously sad to have lost John, um, but thankfully you were there and certainly qualified for the gig since already having recorded and played with them. Well, I, it, I was a fan of the band. I saw them three times as a kid growing up. I had the records. I was from Chicago, so you couldn't turn on the radio without hearing them. Um, it, so they were a hometown favorite. So it, I, I knew all the songs. I knew the live endings. And that, that was sort of the funny thing. When we, the first weeks of rehearsals, they didn't remember how things ended. And I would tell them how the songs <laughs> ended. So, uh, that was, uh, I think that, that kept put me in solid from, uh, from an early position i love it that's great this is the new kid on the block and you know all the songs they've been just playing it too long it's a that, breath of fresh that was, air that was the joke if anyone didn't know anything they'd say ask the kid 
Oh, I love it. That's fantastic. What, tell, tell us about, you know, for somebody who wants to get to be where you are, you know, touring and playing with this kind of band, what's the best thing about being on tour? What's the most challenging thing about being on tour? Uh, well, one of, one of the perks about being on tour is being able to see friends and family and whatnot at least once, if not twice a year, uh, every year. And I see a lot of friends and people that, you know, if I had a, 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 a day job that had me in the same desk for the next 35 years, I, I may never see these people again. Right. Uh, that, that's definitely a perk. I love traveling. I love restaurants. I love uh, um, um, you know, indigenous foods to different locations. Uh, the hardest thing is, is maintaining a sleep schedule, maintaining your health. Um, being away from your family. It was definitely easier as a younger single person than an uh, older uh, husband and father. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's the challenging part. I mean, everything in life has a balance, no matter what you do. So you're trying to constantly juggle plates that are spinning all over the place com comfortably while you might be putting out a fire over here and then you're booking more things over here. And uh, it's that's one of the, the, the difficult things is, is finding a balance, but that's always the case, isn't it? You know? Sure. Absolutely. So how do you do that, Todd? How do you, you know, you're sleeping on buses sometimes in hotel <laughs> rooms. It's a, it's a, it's a, a work in progress all the time, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, you just have to listen to your body and you become very professional at being able to take naps. Like I can normally, as long as the, the carnival party isn't uh, too powerful that day, yeah. Uh, I, I can go sit somewhere for 15, 20 minutes, close my eyes and just, okay, you know. Yeah. So power naps then. Yeah. Power naps are important. I, I, I'd have to be traveling with my like favorite pillow or something like that. It would just get all grungy. It would it'd be a mess, I think. Yeah, you, so. gotta, you just got to learn to sit in a chair, close your eyes and go. Right. <laughs> I think that's actually good advice. So. Hey, you know, everything is better with music, and uh, I, I wanted to play this clip. Our friends at Drumeo, and of course, uh, you know Jared and Dave and all of those guys, you did something special. Well, you've done something special there in total, but this is not this is not playing drums uh, in a van down by the river. You guys helicoptered <laughs> to the top of a mountain. Any hairy moments in the helicopter? Uh, there was one moment, I mean, I, we were with guys that were, the guy, uh, uh, Misha Gelb, who, who's our pilot, he flew that very helicopter around the world. Wow. So this guy, these guys were badasses. These weren't like, hey, Jared knows a guy like, hey, fly a copter. You know, it wasn't, you know, like he's got a wife and kids too. Like he's right. not going to just yeah. <laughs> put himself in harm's way. But we, at one point, you know, it, it was in cl inclement weather. It was raining. It was a bit of wind. And we're flying over uh, Stave Lake in British Columbia, which is a long finger lake. And on either side, there's mountains with nothing but the giant pine trees. Wow. And uh, at one point, the helicopter kind of did one of these like side to side things. And I'm thinking, literally, you know, it, this I'm in a tin can. I could punch through the door of this thing. Wow. Uh, uh, a if this thing goes down, where are we going to land? On top of pine trees on a mountain like this or right into a frozen lake? What's, what's it going to be? Right. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we all live to, to tell the tale. Live to tell the tale. It's amazing. And uh, actually, living to tell the tale, Let me, because we're going to come back to Drumeo in a second, but the, the thing you also live to tell the tale is you played with Spinal Tap somewhere in your career, and somehow you're still here as a drummer. How did that happen? Uh, I think they, uh, they, they maybe Greg this Greg Greg and I are the last two drummers, and I I, I think they uh, they decided to, to to spare two of us and, and let us uh, <laughs> continue to walk the earth That's to great. tell the tale. Yes. Um, yeah. No. I, I I played with those guys in in 2000 and uh, did a couple of TV shows. Uh, boy, it's 10 years ago this month. I want to say 2009. Oh. Oh. And, and Tap has not done anything as Tap a full band uh, since, so it's quite possible I was the uh, I ended their career. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice honor, though I think, right? So, and are are you possibly the guy who they may call though if they do a reunion tour? Well, it was it was Greg's gig. Um, okay. 
So I was I was called to fill in when uh, for several times when when Greg couldn't do it. Got um, it. So who knows? Uh, you know, anything that's ever happened to me, I couldn't have imagined. So uh, I never tried to imagine what could be around the corner because right. I'd, I'd be I'd be o for a thousand. You know. What was the dream you had as a kid of what you wanted to do with music, with drumming? Uh, I really wanted to be a, a session drummer. That was what I sort of set out to do and did for a while until the, the business changed where it was, you know, you know, look at the amount of road work that, you know, Kenny Arnoff and Vinnie Caliuta have taken over the last 10 years. That, that, that tells you right there. Yeah. Um, not, not that sessions don't happen. It's just it's nothing like the old days. Sure. And with music being devalued and recording sessions closing and blah, 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 you know, yeah. it's kind of a, a downward spiral of that. But um, the first time I the, the first time I ever recorded in um, Universal, which is a big giant recording studio in Chicago that of course closed in the '90s, hmm. uh, I uh, was there for the graveyard shift and I saw road cases. Um, and it was you know from one of the session drummers and and it, it didn't dawn on me like oh you could have more than one drum set or more than one cymbal bag yeah. uh, uh, and, and his name Tom, Tom Radke was the name he was like the, the main guy back this was like 1981 okay and so I saw that and right then and there I'm like that's what I want to do I want to be so busy that someone else carries my drums in the recording studio and it's like they're waiting for me I thought that was the coolest thing in the world the, the guy that did all the sessions before, in between Tom Radke and myself, is a guy named Jim Hines. And Jim played in Brian Wilson's band after me. Anyway, Jim, Jim and I were talking one time, and uh, he said he had the same experience with Tom Radke. That's when he knew that he wanted to be a session drummer, because he saw him put a floor tom in his Ferrari outside a little jazz club. And he said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I remember how Blaine called it Carthage or Carthage. What is it? Carthage. Carthage. Yeah. Carthage. Yes, absolutely. And then, and Keith Marks, the guy who recommended me for sticks, like he was my Carthage guy. He ran the Carthage company in town. So if you if you were doing the sessions downtown, Keith had his guys moving your gear, whether it was a B3, a whole keyboard MIDI rack or guitar rigs, bass rigs, drums, whatever. He was the guy. Um, you know, moving. Uh, sorry, I got my lawn guys uh, <laughs> sneaking up on me here. <laughs> it's okay. Have him, he can have him come in, have some iced tea, and he can have the he can have the <laughs> mic as well. Um, we're live with Todd Superman. Get your questions in, your comments, whether you want to ask him about sticks, being on tour, playing with any of the number of folks, Spinal Tap, Brian Wilson, Cartage, whatever you want to ask him. Uh, whether you're live or watching, a lot this of cartridge the, questions today. A lot, a lot of, of cartridge. cartridge, exactly. All right, let's go back to Drumio and and RDM because um, I've spent the last 26 weeks hanging out with you on Drumio. Uh, and for folks who don't know this, uh, Drumio.com, amazing place, and you've been teaching this rock Drumio. rock drum com slash rock. Yes, and the and the rock drumming master class that you have. Please tell us more about this. Uh, when Jared called me last summer with this idea, he wanted to do this twenty six week course and have me write it. Uh, my first uh, inclination was my heart sank, and I just went, "Damn!" <laughs> because I kn I knew I had to do it, and I know how I work, and I work. It's a laborious birth. And I spent the entire rest of that summer tour, which is most of it, writing. I wasn't going to go up there and just like, yeah, just roll camera and, and wing it and have a lot of likes and ums and you knows in my sentences. Uh, I was going to uh, do something that I'd set out to do something that no one had ever done before. Presented so much uh, material but yet in bite-sized morsels spread out over these 26 weeks that, that takes you from point A to point Z, where you also have full access to me, to, to write me, or send me little videos like this, and I could take a picture in my hotel room or write you back like, no, op open a little bit more space in, in here, or whatever it is, whatever the, 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 the topic. So that was, that was sort of the, the, the beginning of this. And I, I, I spent all summer writing it, and it would be like... An hour it'll show time, and I'd be like, ah, oh, damn, close my laptop. <laughs> These pesky rock shows are getting in the way of my work. Um, 
but it, it, it I really really wanted to rise to the challenge and impress Jared and Dave and have them be excited about what this is because what those guys are doing up there is nothing short of astounding and their hearts in the right place they really want to make the world a better place through drums and through music um, and they're just you know they're wonderful wonderful people and smart as hell uh, and I knew that like oh this is gonna be a great fit uh, working with with these guys and we have a we have a great time doing it at the, at the same time so um, that being said, when, when this is all done and filmed and all put together, you know, you never know how it's going to be. It's like you're releasing a movie or right. an album or you're opening a restaurant. Are they going to come? Or are they going to like the food? Right. And from the first the feedback from the first uh, uh, lesson was just, I, and my heart swelled. I'm like, okay, this is, this is going to be great. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be great. And man, with, with the first semester ending now, yeah. the feedback and the testimonials, I can't, I can't read them without, you know, my eyes getting moist because it was such a beautiful thing to participate with yeah. drummers, yeah. thousands of drummers from 50 different countries from all over the world uh, and to help them and have them, you know, note after note saying this changed my life, this changed my life. I, I, I can't even say the, the things, yeah. but it's, the response was overwhelming in all capital letters. And so we decided, well, let's do it again for the people that, that missed out. Because, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And people are always like, yeah, yeah that looks cool. Or, um, well, I don't know. It's kind of expensive. It's not. It's $11 a week. And if this is your, your profession, your passion, it's the price of two cups of coffee at Starbucks. You know, there's nothing to invest in your thing. This is our thing. People go play golf. That's their thing. People go whatever to a shooting range and shoot guns or whatever. That's their thing. Yeah. People go skiing, skydiving, jumping off stuff. That's their thing. Yeah. This is our thing. And to and to say that eleven dollars a week, my goodness. And not comparing myself to Steve Smith, but if I was sixteen years old and Steve Smith did this, you could put two zeros at the end of the price, and I would have found a way to 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 be in a class. I I, I wouldn't have missed it. So. People are going to do what they're going to do, but those those that were um, in or on the fence and got in, every one of them, it just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of notes of, of, of gratitude. So we're, we're hoping that other people that are sitting there going, oh, I don't know, maybe. maybe. Right. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's proven to work. Um, you know, with flying collars already. So if you just, if you want to be a different person, a different player, have your relationship to music, have your relationship to the lyrical content, have your relationship to how you formulate and shape pieces of music, uh, how you relate to other musicians, both personally and musically, conversationally. You know, if, if you can relax here and relax here, then and only then can you be a conduit to who you're supposed to be who your authentic self is on this instrument. And when you're unclouded by nonsense, whether it's mental aspects or physical aspects, then and only then can you really be in touch with the music and be in touch with the conversation that you're having with other musicians who are also not clouded with nonsense. Right. So that, that's, that's when the magic happens. And, and most people I find in, in, in my live master classes and teaching at drum camps, people are screwing themselves up. 95% of all drummers are playing wrong and hold on, I don't have a drumstick. Actually, I got one of my daughter's little tiny sticks here. <clears throat> Most people are grabbing the stick like this or putting it in a big monkey knuckle. You're never going to be able to play ding, 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 ding. It's impossible. And so starting with the grit, starting with your hand positioning, starting with what they're doing with their shoulders or keeping their arms out. And now all these muscles are, are tight. There's so many things that I can identify and help people with. If they want to seek out the help, I, you know, if they want to be able to know how to play the things that they can't play, drummers themselves are screwing themselves up from being able to go through this next level to that level to that level. And it all starts with everything here and everything in here. Absolutely. Yeah, I thought it was a great course. When I saw it, I immediately signed up for it. I would highly recommend it. And, you know, you're not only an amazing drummer, not all drummers turn into educators, Todd. So that I was also wondering where you got the sort of bug, because you're an amazing teacher as well as drummer. How did that come about as well? Well, thank you, man. Um, 
I was very fortunate to go to a lot of drum clinics when I was a kid growing up, but I grew up in Chicago and I went to as many drum clinics as I could. And I found that that information that I got from the drum clinics, from the various drummers that I, I got to see, whether it was a, a hero of mine or someone that I just, I didn't know that much about, but I figured I could learn something. Um, those were all like really kind of pivotal nights, and some more than others. And um, I would go, you know, I saw Steve Smith a bunch of times, I saw Vinnie Kelly a bunch of times, I re would record them and then listen to how they would explain things and begin to formulate other ways when I started to, to, to teach. Right out of, I went to Berkeley for one year, I had an amazing experience with uh, uh, Skip Hayden, who's a wonderful teacher, um, Ian Froman, another wonderful teacher, but totally different. And then Gary Chafee, who is a legendary teacher, but entirely different. So if you study, in my one year at Berkeley too, you know, you're in different drum labs with different drummers. So I always equate it to when you're in a situation like that, it's like you're at, you're at this big giant buffet and you've got your plate and you go, okay, hey, uh, egg rolls, pancakes, you know, <laughs> crab legs. Uh, you know, oh, there's a couple, there's a spicy tuna roll. You know, you put all these weird things together and then you look around and you're the only dude in the room that has this plate. When, when you're in a situation with that, that many uh, uh, different uh, um, influences and references and, and, and uh, inspiration points and, and just educators coming at you, it's a lot. And then you go, I like this from this guy. I like these things from this guy. I like these things from this guy. And hopefully that helps sculpt a unique you, um, and then you got the weird plate with crab legs and, and pancakes. Right. And a little oatmeal on the side, right? Well, so, well. Yeah, chocolate pudding, right? <laughs> well, so that, that was really what, what got me into it, um, that, to continue if I, if I may. Please. Uh, as I, I taught more, um, and have taught more, or especially over about the last five or six years, with the experience that I have now, and I, I would see certain uh, threads with drummers, whether I'm in Prague, London, Nashville, Tulsa, Bangor, Maine, it doesn't matter where. Like, drummers are all doing the same gnarly shit that keeps them from, from, from going up. And it's the 5% are the ones that everyone goes, look, oh, oh how do you do that? Or, oh, he's so fast. Or, oh, it's a God-given talent. No, if you just learn to align yourself with physics and with nature, then that's the only way that you can accomplish certain tasks. Fast singles, fast doubles, fast ride, you know, three and four note patterns with the hand, molar strokes, triplets. You can't do these holding the stick drum core style or big monkey knuckle style or with a tight grip or with the pinkies out or with tight arms all the way up to your neck and a tight mind. If you're, if you're able to loosen all that stuff up, then you can do those tasks. Look at any good jazz drummer. They all, they all can do that. Um, whether you're an architect, a doctor, a golfer, a lawyer, uh, a CPA, whatever your job is, you're going to do it better if you're relaxed than tense. And 95% of all drummers are tense as hell when they play. And we'll never get to, your arms hurt, your elbows hurt, I, I can tell you why. And that's another thing that is great when I get uh, uh, letters back saying the pain in my wrist went away. The pain in my elbows went away. I changed my grip. Change your grip, change your life. Simple as that. Is that also why you uh, have, I know you don't think of it this way, but a high snare? Because I've also raised that up and I felt it's a little bit more comfortable. Talk about that. Of You sort of raised your snare up. There, there's a few reasons why. For, for, for one, it, if I took that wrong, it's a little bit. If I, if I was sitting at the kit, or let's say I was going to break a board with a karate chop, right here, that's the maximum point of impact. So that's where, that's where my snare is, so I can just go back, back, and I'm just nailing that rim shot, and it's a line drive to center field every time. Can't miss, can't lose, no sound replacing in the studio because it's a perfect, consistent whack every single time. So with that being right there, my shoulders are also down and even, and I'm not doing this thing. I'm not. My line isn't all the way down here. Yes. Like a, a match grip when it's right. you got the thigh hitters. Right. There's a, a ton out there. Then that's your line to, to hitting your snare drum like that, and not, not that. 
also when this, well, both your shoulders are down, but when your snare drum is raised, now you have less distance to go from home base to the other areas of the kit. So I, now I'm moving with outward motions as opposed to lifting from down here with my shoulders. Oh, these three hour gigs are killing me. No kidding. Right. Bring your shoulder <laughs> up and now, now you're dealing cards and it's a much easier game, I guarantee it. And it's more playing with the wrists from that angle as well, it seems like. Well, it, it, you, you can, the, can, but then you can do anything. You can bring in some arm and then you can go to full stadium showbiz mode. Right. But, right, but you can get a big, nice sound out of the drums with little effort when you bring up your snare drum to meet you rather than right. whacking it down between your legs. Yeah, I like it. I, I think it's there great. Are, there are great drummers that have their snare low like that. I'm not saying sure. that, that if you do that, you're terrible. Sure. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying for most people, I think it's easier to do that, especially if you're playing traditional grip. You know, every student says to me, hey, well, I'd love to play traditional grip. And show me where your snare drum is. Well, when it's down on the ground, you can't play traditional grip. It's physically impossible. So no wonder why you've never gotten it together. And then it's uncomfortable <laughs> or painful. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's been painful when I've tried it, so I, I will have to adjust. <laughs> um, so I'm curious then, uh, when you were writing Rock Drumming Masterclass on the road, tell me about how you actually conceptualized it, what your vision of wanting to teach others was. I mean, for, first I started to write a lot of big points that I knew could be entire chapters. And then I would sit there and I would look at it and, and start formulating it and then go, well, this has to go before this, or this has to go, oh no, this has to, you know what I mean? So, so then I could see a, a, a chronological step forward with each lesson, as opposed to just having it be a Jackson Pollock painting of stuff right. flying at you. You know, you have to go from point A to B to C to D and, and so forth. So that's kind of how I, I did it. I had to look at the big picture. What are what are the big things I want to talk about? And then when I start writing, I go, you know what? That that could be its own chapter right there. And then oh, okay. So it, it, you know, if I if I looked and just and saw one through twenty six and go, how do I fill this? Well, that's a hell of a daunting task. You know, Jared's thing was was progress over perfection because any any one student could just be stuck at, at week three and go, wait, I'm not moving on until I really nail this. Well, you, you, the best way to learn is you get a little piece of the idea every day, and you, you can only do so much in seven days before all of a sudden there's this other stuff that's thrown at you. Now, the the cool thing about this is you go through it again. Now that you've been through it, you've been through it, but you've just kind of well, you've done what you could, what any individual could with this. And then when you go back and do it again, and I'm not saying you got to sign up again, you have access to this stuff for life. Now it's like, I've, I've carried you for 26 weeks and now you're free, fly away. Right. <laughs> but it's, it's up to you to go back yeah. with what you know now and start over and do it all again. And the level of clarity that you'll find and you're like, oh, this is a lot easier now. Like. And then maybe do it again and do it go back and hit the parts that you want to work on or that you really enjoyed because it's yours forever. I mean, if you buy the program, you have the program. If you don't buy the program and, and just wait to see, you know, my little 50 second clips online versus 16 hours that you get to keep forever with charts and PDFs and everything written out and the technology is bonkers on it, man. Yeah. Individual, uh, um, slow-mo at any moment right. the slower downer right it's pretty oh good oh my god if i had that in the right. 80s when i yeah, was a kid sure. <laughs> right. wow, goodness that's yeah. the coolest thing in the world when they showed me that i lost my freaking mind right yeah the way we learned music is uh take the needle back and put it back on the vinyl record and then yeah <laughs> now i also read so go ahead yeah. well, i was gonna say you know when, when i when i post you know some live sticks things I'll occasionally get someone like, hey, why don't you put a foot cam in there too? I'm like, sorry that one camera on the entire song is not enough. <laughs> you know what I mean, like when I was growing up, like watching a midnight special, like you'd hope right. you'd see a two second clip of the drummer and then you'd have to learn whatever that was. Exactly. You know, and then they, they'd always show the drummer, you'd hear like, and they show the drummer, like, and that's what you got to see. Right, that's sure. what I got to see. Sorry, <laughs> no foot cam. <laughs> 
that's how I had to learn. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then it's always back to the lead singer or the guitarist. So yeah. there you go, right? So <laughs> now I also read with the the rock drumming master class, you talked about your methods and mechanics. You've got methods and mechanics one and two. Uh, and folks can pick that up online, but this is this is like methods and mechanics three through twenty five, kinda or or one because I even sort of start out even simpler because it gave me the chance to go. Let's do this right because you know with methods and when when you're paying, you know what you could buy a brand new Lexus to to do your own DVD. You start going like, okay, guys, we got to keep, let's right. keep going, and then you start going kind of fast, and you might be playing kind of fast because you're thinking about you're just ching 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 ching. How much is this day costing? Yeah. Romeo gave me the chance to go, okay, let's slow down, and let's let's kind of take it from the beginning, and go at an easy pace because I'm not paying, you know, right, right, not I'm not paying whatever you know, yeah. six hundred bucks an hour of right. you know, yeah. studio time, right. Yeah, no doubt. You, let's let's jump back. You mentioned uh, a minute ago, you know, seeing drummers growing up. Who were some of your influences musically, whether drummers or other musicians? Uh, boy, we could talk until sundown and, and sun up about this. I mean, my, my father was a drummer, so he was my, my first drum hero. Mm -hmm. um, Buddy Rich uh, early on, Danny Serafin, I used to listen to Chicago too, in like as oh. a you know, I'm two years old in diapers with my Mickey Mouse record player playing that over and over again. Uh, Sonny Payne with uh, Count Basie. Um, you know, I I, I, I grew up with a, a big band jazz drummer of a father, but I had two older brothers, five and seven years older. So I grew up in the 70s in the era of rock. So, you know, I was familiar whether I liked them or not. I knew, you know, I, I I love Kiss. I love Led Zeppelin. I love The Who. I love Beatles. Like you know, uh, and just everything that was on the radio back then. You know, I was like that was a thing. You drove around your car. Your mom's driving you to school. Mom's driving you to baseball. And like you know, uh, whatever. You know, that whole era. I know all the damn songs. So it's it's funny to me, or it's funny. It's it's amazing to me rather that. It, through my years with Sticks, I got to tour with and be on bands with bands that were the radio of my youth and mm -hmm. who still very much rule the radio waves today in Amazing. 2019. Like who? Who were some of those bands? Oh, Journey, yeah. Ario Speedwagon. Um, uh, uh, we've been done runs with Peter Frampton, Leonard Skinner, uh, Hart. Um, Bad Company, um, Def Leppard. Uh, you know, we were out with Joan Jett last year. Foreigner. Um, Incredible stuff, right? Yeah, it, it's 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 nuts. It's nuts. <laughs> Tell me more. Was was there a Zuckerman family band? You coming from a musical family with your brothers, yeah. with your dad? Yeah. Well, my my mother was a, a, a actress uh, who could also sing and play piano. But my older brother Paul uh, still is a professional um, uh, pianist and a keyboard player and, and educator. He teaches jazz at University of Wisconsin. Uh, my brother Joel uh, got a straight gig. He didn't want he didn't want the musician's life, even though he's a bass player. Um, so we grew up like normal kids. You go for a swim or throw a ball around, and then go in and we play music. And that was a, I mean it was a wonderful card to be dealt in life to. Uh, be the youngest in a musical family because there was always, you know, there could be one type of music or one band or one artist, you know, coming out of one bedroom, coming out of another one. Once something's playing in the kitchen, you know, it was a great way to grow up because it was just music, whether it was Mozart or Led Zeppelin. Right. Yeah. yeah. And was it always the drums for you? Because I've seen you playing the piano a little bit too. Any other instruments? I horribly tinkle <laughs> piano and, and, and guitar but to say that I play them is yeah. an understatement I could I could sit in with no one <laughs> uh, I, I, I could play the, the the beginning of substitute by the who on the on the guitar I could maybe do the intro and then walk off stage um, no it's always been the drums for me yeah. it's always been the drums for me I mean I, I, I enjoy singing but I've always been a little cheapish about it 
But it's just, I like being in an ensemble and being part of that creative uh, thing that only only happens from being a musician and, and playing music and, and, and sharing in that type of thing. So to, to grow up with that was just, you know, it was miraculous. Sure. Tell me some of the big, biggest lessons you learned from both your mom and dad about, you know, because you said your dad was a, a drummer as well, but about music and the music business. Um, be, being on time and reliable was a big thing from, from both my parents, um, especially my dad, because your, your reputation is everything. If you're unreliable, whether you're going to be late or is he going to show up at all or, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter how great you are. That, that's going to hurt you at some point. True. Um, True. So that was a big one. You know, my, my, my father taught me how to read music, how to read charts, how to play, how to, you know, everything. Uh, buzz roll, double stroke, singles, paradiddles, all that. Uh, and just to be reliable and to and to play the music, play for the music, how to keep people dancing, how to keep whoever's employing you happy. Um, you know, uh, I haven't thought about this this in, in quite some time, but those, those are those are some things that are, are coming to mind right now. Yeah. Now I've read he was a uh, not only a drummer but he was a doctor by day as well. Correct? Yes, he he put himself through med school playing drums and he he was Lena Horne's drummer for a bit um, and he was one of the house drummers at the Chez Prix in Chicago for 18 years while he had a, a practice so um, the Chez Prix was where you know everybody that was like the nightclub the cotton club or whatever of Chicago it's so he played the Sammy Davis Jr. Um, uh, uh, Joey Lewis uh, Sophie Tucker you know every friggin' comedian, dead, dead, dead dog act, you know, whatever, singing, ventriloquist. <laughs> dog singing, act. <laughs> his, his head's all right, it's all right. I mean, he's, he worked with all, with all these guys because that was, if you were a star and you did the big show lounges, that was where you, that was where you played. That's incredible. And what kind of doctor was he as well as a drummer? He was a podiatrist. That's fantastic. That's incredible. Got to have it. He fixed Sammy Davis Jr.'s feet on the, on the gig. Really? Wow. Yep. Now, Sammy was quite a drummer as well, right? He's an incredible drummer. Amazing. I don't know what was wrong with his foot, but he, he could still drum. That's for sure. I, I don't know either, but my dad fixed it, so it was okay. <laughs> right. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. The, the other thing I wanted to talk with you about is I, I have not heard anybody else talk about this. You, you talk about the importance of connecting emotionally with song lyrics, whether to help you learn the song or play the song. Say more about that and, and how that came about for you. Well, I, I, I've always been a lyrics guy and, and drawn to the lyrics. And mm -hmm. it, if you if you think it through in these terms, it's, it's pretty simple. But when you're part of an ensemble, you're part of the storytelling process. And that, that, that focal point is the singer telling a story that you are a part of so you're a cinematographer on this film and you can screw it up if you you know i mean it, it, music is much more than just what's the beat i stop here you want to fill in the chorus 16 bar chorus it's, it's more than just numbers and this is conceptually what will work with the song or even uh oh this is nice with the song but if you know what the song is saying then you can attach yourself emotionally to the piece of music. So if you, if you're the singer songwriter or whatever, it, you call me in your studio to play. What's the song? I want to, I want to read the lyrics down. Is it a happy song? It did. Are you broken hearted? Is it a song about a, a friend of yours that died? Like you, you, you kind of have to get into the character of what the song is, and then you're really part of the mood of that song, and you're not just trying to get a job done. You're trying to, uh, I'm trying to please you, you've hired me and I'm here to play the drums and like this, is this good? There you go, sign here, I'll get my check, nice meeting you. Mm -hmm. it, th that way you could really attach yourself to the song and to the people that you're having the experience as you're creating it. That That's like another deeper layer of, of stuff there that most guys don't think about or most guys don't even care about. 
Mm. But that's that's what I I try to do, and and I think some of the best musicians and some of the best drummers, uh, whether they know it or not, they 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 do have that level of um, of care and commitment. Right. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic concept. I, I really like it. Say a little bit about when you don't really connect to some of the lyrics or you're just not you're just not it's not your jam it's, you know you're not jiving with it what's oh, your mindset and then, then you can sometimes feel that right yeah you can sometimes feel that you know it's and i'm not talking about just like on a record date but you could you could walk into a, a club or a bar or whatever and their guys playing and they're punching the clock and they don't they don't care about being there it, it it sounds like they don't care it sounds like the drummer is going I didn't call my girlfriend on bridge. She's gonna kill me. And the bass player is like, three more songs, and we're freaking out of here. And the guitarist is on his ninth beer, and he's looking at his watch. And like that's that's the the that's the shit that's coming off the stage. And then you go to another place, and you see someone's connected to the music, or you see a drummer that's you got three or four guys all agreeing on something, and w- where the pocket is, and having a good time. And then you're like, now we're cooking with gas. Because they are emotionally, whether they know it or not, con- connected. They're not just getting a job done. And that's that's one reason why, for me, anyway, it's how I work. At, at, at other people work differently. But, you know, if you were to call me to, to do your gig and I had to learn 20 songs in four days, five days, I would learn the songs. I wouldn't sit there and go, like, okay, you know, I'm good enough that I can do this. And I'll just write it. Shoot, shoot. And then I'm, I'm just, I'm getting through your gig. I'm supplying you the service of um, I'm I'm letting you make your money tonight and I'm helping you out. I'm subbing and and okay, cool. Can I go now? But if I walk in there and I've learned the stuff, I can own it. I can be part of the conversation. I can now be a living, breathing organism with it without my head stuck or, or counting bars or whatever. Then we've just had a a, a shared collective experience together, and people go. Dude, thanks. That was that was great. And then you're a nice guy. That uh, now you're getting phone calls. But if you go in there just thinking like, I, uh, I, you know, I'm good enough just to fart my way through this, and I'm going to give this gig just the the bare essential of, of, of attention and care. Too many people do that, and it's a friggin' bummer. And I, I've been experienced of been on the bandstand with some great players who I'm like, I prepared for this. I'm busy too, and you're farting all over this. Half of what you're playing is great because you're great, but half of what you're playing is wrong because you didn't care and you, you're just trying to get through the job. I want to sure. live the job. I don't want to get through the job. So mm. that's that's where I come from. Any special tips or techniques of how you learn a song if you've got you know, a few days to do that? First that's off, your... you have to want to learn the song. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's yeah. a big one. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, yeah. I, I learn by repetition. Okay. If, you, if you if you call me on a Monday and, and we're we're doing we're playing on Friday, for those days I would have that music on in the shower. I'd have that music on when I'm cooking. I'd have that music on when I'm driving. I would have that music on all the time. And then now that I'm starting to know it, if there's some tricky figures or what's that or that's kind of a weird that's a that's a, that's a seven bar phrase there. I would I would I now key in on it, and thank God we have the technology. I remember doing the cassette tapes. Right. Uh, uh, I would do that over and over again until I know what it is because I don't want to have my head in the chart. Something about rock drumming masterclass, um, and I, it's another thing that reinforced my notion, is when people would send me, you know, videos or YouTube links of, of their um, rendition to one of the play alongs. Mm-hmm. The guys that were the best players, they learned it. The guys that were the worst players, guys with their heads stuck in the chart the whole time. Worried about the minutiae of which Tom is that? Is it Splash? Is it the, that's the bell of the ride? They're worried about all this stuff. Or if you just learn it, then you, then you, you know it. Yeah. And you you're know. going going for the feel of it at that t- at that point, right? Let's do it over and over and over again. If, if it's, you know, if A, you're commissioned to learn something and you don't like the song, well, you got to learn it anyway. But if you like the song, then it's more of a pleasurable experience to listen to it over and right. over and over. Yeah. It's yeah. a little easier. Uh, a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down, whatever. And then, then you know it. And for me, one, once I learn something, I, I kind of know it forever. Okay. Um, okay, okay, and another analogy. In, in high school, you ever have to cram for a test? Sure. 
you don't remember a damn thing from that. But if you were, were learning a subject that you enjoyed and you had a teacher that you enjoyed, you know that stuff forever. It's yeah. that's the same analogy. You know, you want to you want to get through the job, or do you want to live the job, be, be be part of it and own it and eat, sleep, and breathe it? That's that's my thing. Sounds like that's how you approach it. Whether you're playing live with sticks or you're you're also we talked you're in the in the studio yesterday with Antoine Fafard. Uh, no, gotta... I was in the studio doing doing a, a top secret project uh, yesterday. Not Spinal Tap, then. Oh, no. not, not Spinal Tap, no. The, the Antoine Fafard record comes out uh, at the end of August 30th. But actually, you can pre-order it now at AntoineFafard.com. Uh, the, the cool thing about this is um, Antoine saw uh, a um, YouTube clip of me playing Jerry Goodman's uh, Tears of Joy, which is on the first Methods of Mechanics. And he thought that it would be interesting to have me in this ne next record, even though I'm known as you know a rock drummer. Uh, so this was just ridiculously challenging fusion music. Just you know, no two time signatures in the same, you know, next to each other. Uh, and Antoine plays bass and guitar, and the great Gary Husband on keyboards. So not only is he a brilliant, brilliant drummer, he's a brilliant, brilliant keyboard player as well. So just freakishly talented. Uh, so that was music that, you know, I'm not Vinnie Caliuta. I can't go in there and just you know, poop Mona Lisa's on command and just like read it down and go. How's that? Um, I really wanted to learn this music and be in it. So when I when I played it, I could I could say what I wanted to say within the, the, the piece of music and be part of that conversation musically. You know, so that's I'm really excited that that's uh, that's coming out in the next bunch. What are the what's the mindset similarities and differences for you for going into the studio versus playing live? The mindset is pretty similar because I want to play as well as I can. I want to make the experience with the other musicians as great for them as possible. And I want the music to be as great as possible for whoever will be listening to it, whether it's the audience or a, uh, you know, a, a, a documented piece of music. Um, so the mindset is kind of the same. With a rock show, there's, there's a little bit of, uh, you have to be an entertainer. Uh, there's a little bit of show business as aspect, even though I'm not a stick twirler or like a big, like, look at me, this type of guy. Um, you know, and that's fine. I'm not you right. know, making that, that. That's fine. You know, you're, you're playing a big room. You know, no one wants to see a guy standing there looking at their feet. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the, my mindset is, is the same. Play well and make your instrument sound great. Be balanced here. Play well with others. Listen. Be part of the conversation. Know when to shut up. And try to have it be good. It's not uncommon to have you know a bunch of you know seventeen and nineteen year olds down front singing along with every single song. Right. So they're having a new experience with it. So I mean, the, the, literally the age group from you know from kids from one to ninety two. It's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of that type of thing. So everyone's in their own trip of, of, of what they're experiencing. So it it's. That's the thing about music, man. It's just, it's the human experience. I can't even begin to imagine what anyone's thing right. is, you know, right. or when I go to a show. But you know, when, when some magic stuff happens and you, you feel it in the room, well, you know, you go see The Who and like they're on and towns and windmills for the first time, you yeah. feel the building go like, ah. And that's some shit that you just cannot get that's from right. like watching a YouTube clip. That's right. Oh, I want to see the Who. Okay, do I want to go to the show? I I don't know. But when you're in the room and you feel something happen and you have that collective experience where everyone, right? That's the magic stuff, man. Like I, I can think of so many concerts I was at where like individual points or a certain something happened in the song and I broke into a, you know, like a hot flash or a cold sweat and yes. everyone else felt it. That's right. magic shit, man. And and. You know, it, it, it bums me out that there's so many, you know, people that will just sit and watch stuff on YouTube and sit on a couch and go, all right, that's good enough. <laughs> it's just, it's just not. Why don't you just sit and look at a picture of the Grand Canyon or, you know, right. the Eiffel Tower and go, ah, all right, there's the Eiffel Tower. But yeah. when you're in Paris, you're like, oh, my God, look at everything I see is unbelievable. <laughs> Now, that's the yeah. that's the difference between you know looking at a picture or, or or being a part of something. Right. 
Yeah, and I, I, I've been lucky enough to have that experience. It's the goosebump moment, really, right? Like walking into the stadium and the Who is playing Pinball Wizard and you're like 80,000 people and you're like, oh, this is, this is special, right? So, yeah. Yeah, it, it could, but it could be in a club too. It doesn't have to be 80,000 people. Right. You, could, you know, my, my good, some, some of my favorite musical memories was, was being fortunate to see Tony Williams at the Jazz Showcase so many times. 20, 30 times, you know, from 85 to about 90, about 95. He would come through twice a year and I'd go down and I'd see, you know, two nights and I'd see one set in the front and one set right from the side. And when he would start playing, it would scare me. It was like this fight or flight, big, giant, you know, 24 inch bass drum in a jazz club and he'd just start before anyone else played. And that was just tribal and ethereal and, um, life affirming that's heavy heavy stuff it's amazing yeah todd this has been a blast let's let's end with unless there was anything more that you wanted to check in about um, no man this has been fun thank you it's been fun for me too and I, I i just want to say i really appreciate your music and your teaching it's been really helpful for me um I, I i still got a lot more practicing to do but uh we all do that's the that's, thing we all do isn't it great yeah, well, what are you practicing these days? What are you working on, being at such a high level? Normally, I'm working on things that are coming up right around the bend. Yeah. So I, I, I actually hadn't done a, a proper drum clinic. I've been doing these master classes, but a clinic, I did my, my first one of the year uh, a week and a half ago in, in Denver. So I kind of had to brush up on some of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another one in uh, in Switzerland in September, and uh, then I'm I'm working on one or two records right now. I'm not not at liberty to say at the moment, um, uh -huh. but so I, my mind is kind of there for the the moment. Yeah, more. But, to... Yeah, I I'm always just trying to at this point. I'm not trying for more trickery. I'm just trying to play better until I can play. You know, I want to be able to play a groove and have it you know, be like Steve Jordan or Jeff Beccaro. I can't do that yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I watch Steve Jordan play the simplest thing in the world and I go, how do you do that? Right, exactly. You know, that, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of into more simple things right now yeah. as I age and mature than trying to push the techno, technological limits of, of what I can do. Um, yeah. There's, you know, there's always going to be guys, uh, you know, like incredible guys like, you know, Garrigo Borlai that you just, I see the strength and the speed and I'm just like, holy, you know what, I'm going to, I can't chase that. Um, you know, uh, you know, Vinny Calido, I listen to him and I watch him and just the way that he can just conversationally improvise brilliance. Just like I say, just like like I, I say, you know, crapping Mona Lisa's on command, just got every bar. Just like, like, how do you do that? So, it's you know, if if you if your mindset is is correct about this, you'll you'll die wanting to be a better drummer, and that's what I I want to do. I want to I want to keep doing this and be as good as I can. And there's no spiking the ball in the end zone with this. There's no way to measure how far, um, you know, like a race, how fast you can run a race or how far you could throw a javelin or whatever. This is, this is a personal game that you share with others, but it's, I, I want to be able to do this as well as I, as I can for as long as I can. Yeah, and I, I think you do it pretty well, sir. For my money, you are the American Keith Moon. Let me just tell you, because I think you got, <laughs> I, I think you, I think you got some of that uh, who energy in you from your playing and uh, just the energy. Some of the pictures I see, it's it's really fantastic. Well, thank you, man. I'll I'll I'll, I'll take that as a, he he was a uh, an influence, and I was always charmed by uh, his legend and lore and stories and. Um, I'll take that as a compliment. I just, I just don't want to perish early as he did. That's all. No, 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 no. <laughs> and and I, Keith was a great drummer, but I think you have technically uh, overshadowed well, where he is as well. Just real quick, a lot. Keith Moon is so widely misunderstood. Mm. Um, for those that there's like you know when I talk to people, fifty percent of the people like they don't, they don't get it at all. Yeah. And he was, he was like. He played like a jazz drummer where he never wanted to play the same thing twice. Yeah. 
and he kind of hated having to play part certain certain things and he played things by accident and he was just a tornado was he a great drummer like his hands like buddy rich no not even close was he a great drummer like where he he came up with these great parts like john bonham or a groove like john bonham no not even close but it was totally different yeah. it was just this joy and this reckless abandon and you know when i talk about Ke keith moon then some people go like oh yeah you're you're, you're a um uh, uh you're, you're touting a guy who who drank and, and drugged himself to, to death, great uh, role model. Like, well, okay, should we stop listening to Jimi Hendrix? Right. The Beatles took a lot of drugs. I tell you right. what, let's, right. let's flush uh, uh, Sergeant Pepper uh, down the toilet because those guys weren't high when they did right. that. Record. Right, clapped well, it, right, yeah, everybody. On. Yeah. It, it does, like, separate that shit from the music. Right. Let's look at what, what he was doing. And, and Keith Moon's playing, especially in, in for my, money and, and in my opinion there was something really special between 69 and 71 with his playing yes. 73 quadrophenia was still great but that was the first signs that the, the yeah. booze and drugs were, were starting to make him sluggish and it was a little downhill from then although he still had some cool stuff yeah. but go go listen to live at leeds the you know the the, the, the full one who's next mm. uh th those are those are just monoliths in drumming and a snapshot in time that we will never uh, have again. His energy was unbelievable. And you're going to get it or you're not going to get it. I didn't get Jimi Hendrix for a long time. That, that sounded like Vietnam to me or like some in the recordings were shitty and grainy and it was like a, 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 um, a, a, a history class. But then one day I got it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And like, yeah, you look at him like, he's, he's kind of the coolest guy ever, isn't he? Um, <laughs> Yes. You know, I mean? and, but things, if that's art, man, things hit you right. or they don't. You could be at a museum looking at a painting and that guy's just going like, I don't get this. And the guy next to you's just got tears streaming down his face. That's exactly. the thing with art. The thing that I don't do is if I don't like something, I don't shit have someone. I don't write right. things on. That's, that, that, that's the thing. That's the one. Sorry, I can go off on a tangent here. But that's no. the one dangerous thing about the Internet. This is like some little kid will post them um, playing the right. drums and then he'll get wailed on. Right. And maybe he doesn't know that it's okay that, that he's good and he's going to listen to some guy pressing that button right you know so if there's any any young musicians out there get get thick skin and plow through it if you do this do it because you love it and we're all working on it don't right. don't let people who have no skills or no talent and live in their mom's basement tell you that you can't do something that's right I think that's the best advice of the day. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, this has been a real blast for me. It's great to connect with you. Hang on the line. I'm going to end the live broadcast. But Todd Sugerman, thank you so much for being on Musicians on the Record today. Thanks, David. It was a pleasure, man. Take care.